Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me to your uh, session today on a very topical issue of uh, how to revive the economy in COVID times. Um, you have told me that um, I would be required to say a few words at the beginning uh, before the discussion starts. So <clears throat> I'll begin with that. Uh, before we come to the present situation and uh, before we discuss what steps need to be taken in order to alleviate the present conditions and revive the economy and take it back on the growth path again, it is uh, perhaps necessary for us to examine it in the context of the economic conditions prevailing just before the uh, attack of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and we are all perhaps aware that uh, for the last two years, the Indian economy has been in the grip of a slowdown. For seven, eight quarters, our growth rate had uh, been declining rather consistently and uh, our growth rate had come down from a high of uh, over 8% to just about 4%. It was a decline of 400 basis points or 4 percentage points over the high which was recorded a couple of years ago. Uh, there are many reasons why the slowdown was um, occurring, but it is instructive for us at this stage to recall that the most important reason for the slowdown in our economy was a collapse of demand. In very simple terms, what keeps an economy moving? What keeps an economy growing? What keeps an economy growing is the growth in demand of uh, its people. If that growth does not take place, growth in demand, then naturally production capacities will become surplus. And uh, even installed capacity will not be fully utilized. And therefore, because of the demand production slowdown, the entire demand in the economy and the entire production in the economy gets affected. And the economy enters a slowdown phase. What happened in our country was that this decline in demand first began from the agricultural and the rural sector. And um, this began from the agricultural rural sector because the farmers of India were not getting adequate prices for their produce. I myself got involved in uh, farmers movements in Akola in Maharashtra for instance. And what I noticed there about two, three years ago was that suppose uh, a farmer had produced 10 quintals of ground. There are agencies of the government which will uh, proceed to buy what the farmer produces at minimum support prices. But in the instance case, what happened was that if the farmer had produced 10 quintals, let's have ground now then the agencies will tell him that we'll buy only two, two quintals from you at minimum support prices and the balance eight quintals you sell in the Monday, in the market. And uh, the traders in the market knew the compulsion of the farmer, his need for immediate cash. So they, they would dictate the prices in the Mondays. So the farmer, farmer's income did not rise. 
in comparison to the cost of agriculture. So the farmers' incomes started declining, and because the rural economy is largely, as we know, agriculture based, therefore there this lack of income on the part of the farmer became lack of income on the part of the rural economy as a whole, and therefore when there was not enough money in the pockets of people who live in the villages. their demand came down they would spend whatever their earning was on essential rather than any discretionary purchases so this has started reflecting in the most important discretionary purchase that we have in our system namely automobiles two wheelers and uh, we know for a fact now that quarter after quarter after quarter or month after month the 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 four wheelers and two wheelers even affecting truck demand three wheeler demand has been declining every month that this industry came out with figures they mentioned it was a decline of 15 percent, it was a decline of 12 percent, it was a decline of 16 percent. So, as it happens in any economy, in our economy also, the decline in demand from almost 50 percent of our population started reflecting on the industrial economy, <clears throat> and when the industrial economy was affected. then many sectors of the economy not only automotive many sectors of the economy also got affected so with an overall decline in demand in the economy and every sector of the economy getting affected we entered a phase of slowdown now this unfortunately was not only happening domestically but it was also happening as far as our exports our exports did not perform very well and the result was that on the export front also the external demand which sustains a major part of our economy was not available to the economy so that was another contributing factor for the slowdown then you know the financial sector had its own problems we you know it that uh, this government when it came into office in 2014 <clears throat> it inherited a major problem of bank npas non performing assets and because the problem resolved and um, uh, problem remained unresolved the banks became reluctant to lend and despite the fact that the reserve bank of india kept bringing down the interest rates there was no demand for fresh investment because the existing capacity was not being fully utilized and therefore fresh investment was not taking place so there was no demand for bank funds additionally the banks in view of their npa problem <clears throat> were also reluctant to lend so all these factors combined external as well as domestic to push the economy indian economy into a slowdown phase it was we were in this phase which was mind you becoming worse by the day the crisis was deepening when suddenly covid appeared on the international scene and then naturally as was expected was imported into india also <clears throat> the first covid case in india as you are aware was recorded in kerala on 30th january 2020 now the government had to formulate its response 
to the COVID crisis, taking into account the fact that the economy was already in a slowdown phase. <clears throat> the government waited for the whole month of February. The government waited for almost three weeks of March before we announced a severe lockdown on the 24th of March. The impact of the severe lockdown was that everything closed. It was like a hammer which came down on the entire economy and all economic structures in our country. It's another matter <clears throat> that this could have been anticipated. Why was it not anticipated is a question which I'll, I will not answer at this stage. Uh, so everything closed down, starting from midnight of 24th March. The first lockdown was, as we are aware, of 21 days. The Prime Minister famously talked about the Mahabharata war having lasted for 18 days. He said, we will take a little longer, three days longer, in order to conquer COVID. And therefore, he was imposing a lockdown of 21 days. He realized, as 21 days were nearing, the end of 21 days, that the situation had only worsened. And therefore, we extended the lockdown again. The second lockdown came. Then the third lockdown came. And then the fourth lockdown came, which is likely to end, hopefully, on the 31st. We are talking on the 26th today. And um, we wait to see what happens to the fourth lockdown. But in the meanwhile, the economy has collapsed. So what is the situation today? The situation today is that whatever the statistical jugglery might suggest, the fact remains that from around 350 cases, positive cases of Corona, on 24th March, the number of cases has gone down to perhaps 130,000, 130,000 today. And it's rising exponentially. People are predicting that as more tests are done, more people will test. We have been able to uh, bring down the incidence of the disease as China was able to do or many other countries. But we have successfully destroyed the Indian economy during this period because everything closed down. The byproduct of this closed down was, especially in the absence of support to the migrant workers who had gone from the poorer states to the better of states to work in those states in the absence of support system they started walking back or using whatever means of transport they had at their disposal to their villages because they were on the point of starving in those industrial centers so a huge problem of the migrant workers has arisen it's a social problem it's an economic problem which is going to be with us for a while. And it's a humanitarian problem. So these are the scenes that we are witnessing in our economy. Perhaps when the government realized that uh, they cannot stop this reverse migration, then they opened up first the railways through the Shramik specials, then little more. <clears throat> now they have opened up the airlines. Both these efforts were unfortunately accompanied with incompetence. And therefore, we have had the 
instances of trains which have finished their journey in 20 hours, traveling for 48 hours for 72 hours. And the migrant workers have been imprisoned there literally without food and water, leading to law and order problems at various railway stations. Similarly, yesterday, the first day when they had, the flights were allowed, there was complete chaos at various uh, airports. Be that as it may, the point which I'd like to make is that if there is a lockdown, there will be no economic activity. So we have to relax the lockdown. How do we find that, um, that, that golden mean which will enable us on the one hand to control the spread of the virus and on the other hand, enable the economy to function. This is the challenge which the government faces. So far, the government has not been able to find that golden mean. In the meanwhile, the state governments have started asserting themselves. And we have instances, for instance, especially in civil aviation, where they have refused to abide by the instructions of the government of India, because they are concerned about the spread of disease in their own respective states. So, you know, the states will have to be taken along also in finding or discovering that golden mean. Now, first of all, therefore, if we want to revive our economy, we have to ensure as much of near normal conditions as possible, which means factories will have to be open. Backward and forward linkages will have to be established so that the production and the marketing chains work in tandem. The workers will have to be found who will work these, in these units. And most of all, most importantly, whatever is being manufactured must find a market. So the distribution chain will have to work. We know for a fact now that nearly 60-70% of our GDP is accounted for by metros and cities and areas which are in the red hot zone even today which are the worst affected. So how do we do it is a challenge for the administration. But the most important challenge for the administration is production will take place and marketing will take place only when there is demand. Suppose a unit produces anything, it is able to bring it to the shops but you and I are not interested in buying it, or we don't have the capacity to purchase it, then what is going to happen? Then the product will not be sold, and there will be a problem for the production needs. So therefore, we need to revive demand, which has been in the gold run for the last two years. We have to look at the reasons why Demand was in the doldrums over the last two years. We have to look at the fresh reasons which have led to complete collapse of demand in COVID time, put together steps which will then enable demand to start picking up. It will not happen immediately, I can assure you, but it could start picking up. How will that happen? Now we know that we have some very eminent economists in India and abroad, who of them have no, are Nobel laureates. Now they have all been suggesting that we have to put money in the hands of the people so that they are able to start consumption. And if it's only when people start consumption that demand will rise. I have a very important point to make here. And that is that when I was finance minister, it's a long, long time ago, many of 
you would not have been even born in those days. But it is instructive to recall that experience. What was that experience? We were faced with many challenges, including, for instance, of economic sanctions by the leading countries of the world. And the sentiment in the economy, Indian economy, had declined to almost zero. Nobody was giving Indian economy a chance. So we had to literally pick up the Indian economy by its bootstraps and raise growth. Now we came to the conclusion to growth was the easiest thing to do. But what will that lead to? It will lead to increase in demand, but increase in demand of what? Essentials and other consumption items, including perhaps discretionary purchases. But we did not want this cycle because we knew that it will have a bad impact on inflation. So we, we decided to sequence the growth in demand in such a way that first there was an increase in the demand of investment goods. There are the demand in the economy can be divided generally into two categories. One is consumption demand of people like you and me. The other is investment goods demand, which economic activity in the country like, um, uh, like industries, industrial development, like infrastructure development, that will create. And what will be that demand mainly about? That demand will be investment goods like cement, like steel, like other building material, etc. So we decided that with our limited budgetary resources, we shall first give a push to demand for investment goods. That worked. Why did we start working on national highways? Why did we start working on rural roads, state roads? Why did we start working on telecom? Why did we most of all start liberalizing the housing sector? Because all these areas of the economy create a multiplier effect in the economy. So one thing will lead to another and to another and ultimately end up creating employment opportunities. So therefore, we sequenced the creation of demand, the generation of demand, in this manner that we first create the car resources and financial institutions resources, the demand for investment goods. In order to create that demand, you had to start certain projects, which we did. And then demand for consumption goods will automatically follow. I'll give you the salutary example of a plastic manufacturer. I was traveling abroad in an Air India plane when I shifted from the Ministry of Finance to the Ministry of External Affairs. And this is an example which I have mentioned even in my recently published autobiography. Uh, there were some uh, friends from industry who were traveling by the same flight. So when they saw me, they started discussing uh, the economic issues of the day. And uh, then they asked me, they said, now that you have shifted from the Ministry of Finance, what would you regard as your most important achievement? And I said, I would consider growth in demand that we were able to create through various methods, including, for instance, making cheaper it available. I said that will be the most important contribution that I made to the Indian economy. There was another passenger who was quietly listening to the conversation. When I said this, he got up from his seat 
walked up to where we were standing and said, sir, I was listening to your conversation. I am a living example of the policy that you follow. I said, how? He said, I, or my unit was manufacturing plastic goods and it closed because there was lack of demand, cost of production was very high because I had borrowed at almost 20-22%. Uh, I could not service my debt and therefore I had to close my unit and uh, you know, go tell my workforce to go home. But when you reduce the cost of interest and told the banks that they could go for debt restructuring, then I took advantage of that, went to the bank, restructured my debt. I have today bor I'm borrowing at much lesser um, rate of interest. My unit has opened. In fact, I am employing more people and I am going abroad to look for export markets. This is what he told me. Now, the point I am making is the challenge before every administration is one, to ensure that demand is created in a proper sequence. Number two, that, um, that all other steps are taken in order to ensure that uh, you know, industrial units first to complete 100% utilization of existing capacity, even more. And number two, creating additional capacity, create additional employment opportunity. This is how money travels to people's pockets. And demand for consumption goods is created. And then they go to the market and start consuming. We have had examples, I'm not going to details, of another crisis in 2008, where the government of the day tried to raise consumption demand directly through various methods. That led to inflation because we did not take adequate supply side measures. So, it led to inflation. And that created its own um, a rippling effect on the entire economy. But today, unfortunately, as you know, there is the demand side and the supply side in, in any economy. Today, unfortunately, through all the steps that the government has taken earlier to meet the slowdown, and second, today, they are mostly on the supply side. They are not on the demand side. And this is the criticism of the recent 21 lakh crore package that the government has announced. And um, clearly, even a person like me believes that this package is not going to work in the immediate near future. There are many long-term measures which are good, but they will take their own time. And it will not be possible for industrial units to open and for demand to pick up. So we need a completely new set of demand side measures in order to be able to revive our economy. And when I'm talking of demand side measures, I said we have to find ways and means of reaching people, a money to pay people. Who, what is preventing us, for instance, from picking up buildings and stopping um, miles and miles of national highways today, of improving the railway network, of uh, building rural roads, of uh, uh, doing many other things in the economy and putting together those measures which are necessary in order to uh, supplement the demand side measures. So that unfortunately has not happened. It is going to take time. I'll end by adding just one more point. I have experience of first, first, first hand experience of the crisis of 1991, first hand experience of the crisis of 1998 post the nuclear test. I have first hand knowledge of the 
crisis of 2008. And I can assure you, this is not going to end in three months. It is not going to end in six months. Crisis of this proportion, which is absolutely unprecedented, which is global, will take time to get rid of. And therefore, we are in for a long haul. We should all tighten our belts so that we can make our contribution to the economy whenever the need arises. Thank you. I'll stop here and then take your questions. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, unfortunately, there is some technical glitch still going on at my end. So I will ask uh, Shubham, uh, can you uh, start with the questions that have come for sir? Uh, it was really a detailed and analytical uh, uh, you know, explanation for what is the current scenario of our current uh, Indian economy, and especially in the time of pandemic. Uh, so I would request Shubham, uh, can you start reading the questions that has come for sir? We have to be careful because your voice is breaking. Yes, sir. Actually, there is some uh, technical glitch from Siddharth sir's end. And I'll go ahead with the questions. The first question is from Navneet Anand. He's a student of BLLB from semester two. His first question is, sir, in the past, you have been an IAS bureaucrat from 1959 to 84. In the current situation, how crucial is the responsibility of the local administration at the district level in bringing the Indian economy back on track? Well, you know, the, the, the saying goes that um, in our structure of administration, we have the PM and the CM and the DM. Uh, India is a vast country. It's a very varied country. Uh, the first mistake that we make is we prescribe one size fit all. That does not happen. Actually, what is needed today in not only tackling the pandemic, but also in other uh, areas, is uh, decentralization and delegation of authority. That's very important. And take it right down to the level of a district. It's a district administration which must be called upon to play a very important role during this period. For instance, take the, uh, take the plight of the migrant workers. They are migrating to some district in this country. And the district authorities have a very good idea of where they are going. Because in most cases, they are the ones who are taking them there. So isn't this the best time to start registering something that we have not done in the past, despite the existence of an act? Start registering migrant workers. Instead of letting this golden opportunity of registering them uh, bypass us. So there is a lot of responsibility that we can cast upon the district administration. Which factories should open? Which are the, uh, the hotbeds of the virus at this point of time? Who knows it better than the district administration? So as the uh, formula goes today, test, isolate, Quarantine those who came in contact with uh, that positive patient who was tested positive and contain the zones in which this has been found. So test, isolate, quarantine, contain. But you don't have to do it for the whole country. You don't have to do it for a whole district. You have to do it for a specific areas. And those, I know, for instance, in my own district in Jharkhand, the district my state isolated or, 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 or zone where a positive patient was find, found in a five kilometer radius. That's all. So, in the rest of the place, people are free to go about their activity if there has not been a national lockdown. Now, this is the kind of refinement that we need in our lockdown. The hammer approach will not work anymore because the hammer approach has led to complete uh, destruction of our economy. So therefore, 
decentralization, therefore delegation of authority, right from the PM to the CM of the state and to the DM of the district. This is the line that we should follow. Yes, sir. His uh, second question is, the US-China tensions are at their peak, keeping in mind that the world will take time to normalize, normalize economically. Do you think that the situation will be in favor of India and the setups in China will tend to shift to India and that India will emerge as a global economic leader in the coming times? It's a very, very ambitious question. If you, there is China-US uh, tension, there is a China, there is an India-China tension also at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, and for uh, all that we know, China might be creating this tension precisely in order to prevent those companies which are today situated in China from shifting to India. That is point number one which I know. Point number two that I like to make is that companies are already shifting from China, but they are shifting to places like Vietnam, they are shifting to places like uh, uh, Indonesia. They are shifting generally to East Asia, except for one uh, shoe company that has come to Agra. I am not aware of another case of a Chinese of a, of a, uh, a global company situated in China from coming to India. And there are many reasons for it. Um, I just said some good words about the bureaucracy, but let me also add that the bureaucracy is the biggest hurdle when it comes to industrialization, when it comes to granting life uh, permissions, various permissions for uh, an industrial unit or undertaking to start operations. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from Karan Patel. He is a student of psychology from Amity University, Mumbai. His uh, question is, do you think the Indian banking system, as much stressed it is at this moment, will again look up to the government for a bailout from the government using the taxpayers' money because of the rising NPAs? And what do you think of banks flooding RBI and not lending out even after they have cut the repo rate to 4%? Um, see, First, I'll take the last question. Lending is a function of demand for funds. Even if the banks are flushed with funds and they're inviting you to come to the bank and borrow at negative rates of interest. Will you go and borrow it? Because a borrowing is a borrowing which will have to be repaid. Now, if you feel that you don't need that money, you will not borrow, whatever the rate of it. Therefore, in recent days, there have been many economists who have, or analysts who have said that a uh, cut in interest rates also is not going to help. Because you know, availability of funds in the banks will not automatically lead to a, an increase in demand. Increase in demand, as I have explained, will happen because of various other reasons. The second is reluctance on the part of the banks to lend because, as I said, they have suffered in the past because they have lent. We have seen what's happened to Yes Bank. We have seen what's happened to a number of other banks and financial institutions and NBFCs. There is no doubt that there is a lot of muck in the system. It has been misused. But the fact remains that bank officials who made funds available through borrowing to various people are today in great trouble. So the best is not to give money. Nobody has ever been dismissed in a bank for not lending. People have been dismissed for lending. So the safest course to adopt for a bank employee is not to lend. Just sit on his haunches and not do anything. So it's a very complex situation. And 
is not easily amenable to a solution. We'll have to, as I said, think of a, a package of measures in order to be able to resolve this problem. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from Priyanka Sharma. She is a student of BA LLB. She's asking India moved away from a policy of ad hoc deficit financing for raising funds in 97, 98. How did you as the head of finance ministry facilitate this remarkable change? No, I would not like to take credit for it. This was something which was uh, um, uh, envisioned by Dr. Manmohan Singh when he was the finance minister. He mandated, I think in 92 or 93, that government of India will not borrow from the Reserve Bank of India, which means that government of India will not ask Reserve Bank of India to print money to meet the deficit of the government. Instead, the government will go to the market like every borrower and borrow at market rates of interest. So that that acts as a disincentive to the government from borrowing freely. If you have the Reserve Bank of India standing right behind you and its open system, you can call upon its resources whenever you can to finance your deficit, then you will behave irresponsibly. I added to this by bringing the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act by stipulating that the government of India as well as the state governments will over a period of years, reduce their deficits, uh, still borrowing from the market. But the borrowing will be for investment purposes, not for current consumption. So therefore, over a period of time, various governments have stipulated that government of India will not borrow from the Reserve Bank. But, and there is a very important part, I have also suggested that in these very trying times, you have no option but to make a departure from this rule and go to the Reserve Bank of India and borrow. Why am I saying it? Why a lot of other people saying it? Because it's the government's responsibility to, to ensure that money reaches people's pockets. We cannot depend on the private sector, whether in the MSME or large sector, to perform this function today. It will have to be done by the government. So therefore, where will the government get the money from? Some money will come from here and there. I have calculated that you know, if the government were to tighten its belt, obviously there is no evidence even at this stage to reduce its expenditure something like three percentage points of reduction in government's expenditure is possible, which today means three lakh crore rupees. Another three lakh crore, two lakh crore will come from savings on account of the taxes on petroleum products, because we know that international crude prices are affected, and the money is going into the pockets of the government of India and the state government. So some money will come from there. You can think of other innovative means to raise this, but at least another five to 10 lakh crore will have to be borrowed by the government. Now you're aware of the fact that government was planning to borrow something like a little over, a little less than eight lakh crore this year. They have raised it by a little over four lakh crore. So the total borrowing of the government this year will be around 12 lakh crore, but this is not going to suffice. Government will have to borrow more and they cannot depend on the market for doing this. So they'll have to go to the RBI, which means RBI will have to print money and make it available to the government. Now, having said that, I also like to add that printing money to meet the government's deficit is a very bad idea because it leads to inflation. But in today's situation, if adequate steps are taken, then that situation will not arise. We already know that wholesale price index has been declining because of lack of demand. So by some careful management, it is possible 
to ask the RBI to print notes and meet the government's deficit, which is supposed, which is going to be large, and at the same time control things. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Sumit Desai. He is a student of BTech from Amity University, Mumbai. He wanted to know your views on the idea of a self-reliant India, and does the financial package announced serve the purpose? First of all, let me tell you that the concept of self-reliant India did not suddenly come like the lockdown during these times. In fact, India has been talking about <coughs> self-reliance from even before independence. Whenever the then Congress party used to prepare its economic resolution for independent India, they always talked of a self-reliant India and asked in their work. That was the basis of Gandhi's economic philosophy. Nehru talked about it on many occasions. The second five-year plan of India was completely based on Atmanirbhar Bharat, which led to the creation of many heavy industries in our country. So self-reliance Atmanirbhar Bharat has been the clarion call of every government which has taken office in this country. But, as I have said on various occasions, Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India does not mean India producing those things which India cannot use competitively. We live in a globalized world. Trade is liberalized, investment is liberalized. Therefore, we have to be competitive even domestically. This is the challenge which I faced when I was finance minister, when the economy opened up. That, um, you know, if you, the consumer in India, had a choice, he would rather go and buy Chinese products, which were cheaper, which are cheaper than something which is manufactured by an Indian. Uh, company, which is uh, more expensive. You know, the same thing applies to Indian industries. So therefore, please go ahead, make India self-reliant in every field where you can manufacture things which are competitively manufactured so that the manufacturer is able to sell it not only in the domestic market, but also in the international market. Otherwise, you will end up doing what we did then we had a closed economy of creating a very costly economy. So the transaction cost was high, the ultimate cost of a product was high, and India was uncompetitive in the global market. So that is not the path which I recommend. I recommend India becoming self-reliant in many areas, but there are many areas where we, we are not yet in a position to uh, produce competitive. So we'll have to wait until <clears throat> we are in such a position. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the next question is from Kostov Das. He is a student of BA Political Science. He is asking generally, the Indian election process is criticized for not including key factors such as economy or development in campaigning. But after going through the lockdown and its effects, will the future elections be contested on the actual issues of concern? <laughs> That means to be seen, elections are still uh, four years away. So, as we know from experience, uh, we are all deeply involved in the crisis today, but we don't know what's going to come tomorrow or the day after. So, this is a long time away. But certainly, certainly, in Bihar, which is going to going for elections later this year, in Bengal, which is going for elections next year, many of these issues are bound to figure out as election issues. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from Bhargav. He is a student of mass communication. He is asking, uh, UP government has set up a migrant commission for skill mapping and getting jobs for laborers. Should there be a nationwide commission to bring some structure to this largely unorganized sector where migrant workers can be incentivized to register for jobs? to make the process more efficient and reducing the distance traveled by these migrants in the post-COVID world? 
there is a 1979 act passed by parliament about migrant workers, which um, talks about registration of each migrant worker. It talks about registration of each contractor who takes them from their villages to wherever. It talks about welfare measures for them. It talks about, uh, you know, helping them traveling to and fro. It talks about various things. Unfortunately, this act of 1979 has been observed more in detail. So today, what is the situation? Today, the situation is that an individual, <coughs> like I'm living in, let's say, Darbhanga in Bihar, and I don't have any means of employment in where I'm living. Somebody will come and tell me, oh, there are very good opportunities in Kanpur or Delhi or Ludhiana or Tirupati or uh, Mumbai. Why don't you go there? So I'll go there and become a migrant worker. I'll perhaps find employment somewhere. This is the first one. Second is there are registered and unregistered contractors who go to villages and persuade people to travel with them to various industrial centers where they will ensure that they are employed. In many cases, as I said, these are uh, Contractors are not even registered, with the result that they exploit the labor. Uh, so, what we need is the rigorous implementation of the 1979 Act. It could be examined certainly in today's situation, and if there are any deficiencies in that Act, those deficiencies, including skill development, could be taken care of. But a migration commission which will insist on every labor worker to, uh, to take the permission of the migration commission, let's say in UP, to migrate to some other place of work, will only involve him in a bureaucratic maze. And this militates against the idea of one India. And therefore, strongly of the opinion that state governments creating such commissions where which will become another level or layer of, um, of pain for the migrant worker is not going to wait, work. Certainly have a migration commission which will ensure that every contractor is registered, that every worker is registered, that imparts skills to the worker but does not stand in the way of the worker to migrate to another place for employment or better employment. These people have migrated to other states from UP, Bihar and Jharkhand because these are poorer states which have not created employment opportunities in their own states over these years. So don't put another burden on the migrant. Right, sir. Sir, uh, before we move ahead with further questions, uh, I just wanted to ask how much time do we have in hand? Uh, can we extend it till uh, one fifteen, if you permit us? Okay, you can yeah. go ahead. I'm uh, yeah, sir, <laughs> I have one couple of questions. Sorry for the technical glitch in the beginning. Actually, there was some issue with my audio. Uh, I've resolved you that. Give, uh, give, uh, ask the questions one by one. Yes. So, uh, I basically wanted to ask... Uh, when we talk about the power center and uh, especially after 2014, we have seen a very a dramatic shift in the power center, centralization of the power, PM, CM and BM. You being a former bureaucrat and a civil servant and experience how the bureaucracy works. Do you think that uh, the current situation, uh, the socio-political situation is also credited to the centralization of power? It is. It is. Not only to centralization of power, but also to the tendency to take an announced sudden decision. Uh, demonetization, for instance, is one. The midnight announcement of uh, GST is another. Both these were done without adequate preparation. And I have no hesitation in saying that uh, the lockdown of 24th March was also announced without any adequate preparation. 
but i'll tell you not only as a civil servant but even as a uh, minister in government of india whether it was then in the six month uh, of some shekhar's prime ministership or it was in the five years of vajpayee's prime ministership i have not seen a regime of this kind where people are scared to offer views people are afraid you know whether they are civil servants or they are ministerial colleagues they are afraid to offer their frank views i remember in the vajpayee cabinet used to have fierce discussions i had as i as finance minister was charged with the responsibility of giving the finance ministry's views on various proposals that came from other ministries and it often led to very heated arguments between uh, the line minister and me but mr vajpayee never interfered never said no 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 don't don't discuss he certainly didn't want us to cause the light as for the civility of discussion was concerned but never prevented a discussion never prevented any one of us from offering our frank views never interfered in our work unless it was absolutely either mandated or necessary so therefore every minister in the vajpay cabinet felt free to function within the limits of his own ministry unfortunately that whole system collapsed i'll just give you an example yes in 2014 the prime minister the current prime minister announced that a group of ministers being formed to discuss an issue is a bad idea so he abolished all groups of ministers which had been uh, which were there from the upa times there were any number of groups of ministers there in vajpayee time and they resolved many important issues through the group of ministers but the present prime minister abolished it now the groups of the groups of ministers concept has come back because it's a very necessary um, instrument in the functioning of the government so functioning unilaterally functioning without proper advice functioning and announcing decisions in a certain manner are not the stuff of which good administration is made of right shubham sure. uh, the next question yes sir uh, the next question is from uh, rakshit he is a bcom student and he is asking sir according to you how can we capitalize on low crude oil prices given india's high dependence on oil well um, you know when uh, one is to provide some relief to the consumers at this stage i think it's very unfair that uh, whatever the situation the government has to the appropriate for itself the entire uh, uh gap between what the price should be uh compared to the international crude price and what the price um prevailing price was that's not fair two this is the time when we should enter into long term contract create more reserve storage capacity and keep the oil in our charge you are aware of the fact that in us because us is sitting on huge um imported reserves of crude oil it's so huge that they have the capacity to influence international crude oil prices so india should use this opportunity as i said to build our reserves it, it will need investment in a storage creation of a storage capacity but this is a time to go ahead and raise it uh to a very very large extent and take advantage of um lower crude prices yeah yes sir uh, and uh, his second question is sir according to you by how long is the target of a 5 trillion dollar economy is pushed back by <laughs> you should ask the <laughs> government 
you should ask the government, which was talking about five trillion economy. I was never a great believer in five trillion economy because five trillion dollar economy. Nobody understands what trillion stands for. Nobody buys here in dollars. They don't even know the value of dollar compared to the rupee. So what's the point in talking about five trillion dollar economy in our country for our country? We should rather talk of when are we going to reach full employment? When are we going to reach uh, uh, or improve the quality of life for poor people? These are the issues which are more germane to our economy than than a five trillion dollar economy. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from Dolma Sharma. She is a student of BA Political Science. She is asking, will the core inflation rate rise in the year 2020? Uh, no, if demand is uh, in a slump like it is today, then it's very unlikely that core inflation will rise or any kind of inflation will rise. But if the government were to help the demand side, then I can't make a guess. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I had a question actually. I am Shubham Chauhan, a student of BA Political Science. I wanted to know your opinion on how, uh, if uh, one had to talk about the coordination, the level of coordination that the central and the state governments are showing. Do you think that in this kind of a situation it is adequate because we have seen a number of allegations that have been put forth by various state governments on the central government and the blame game of uh, be it for the shramik specials or the economy, the uh, release of funds by the government for the GST funds. So what do you think? How will you rate the coordination level of the central and all state governments? And the first point which I'd like to make is to remind you that when the present Prime Minister should obviously talk of Team India and he said Team India will consist of chief ministers and important ministers of the central government. So remember that then, as we went forward, and I said in answer to uh, another question, that uh, Team India never happened, and all power got concentrated in one or two hands. When this crisis hit us, the Prime Minister did not have any discussion with the Chief It's only later, because there was no way in which he could proceed further with uh, lockdowns without taking the chief ministers into confidence that the chief ministerial meeting to the prime minister to video conferencing started. We have had four or five of them so far. But chief ministers are crucial. They have to be taken on board. Whether we like their faces or not, they are still chief ministers of their states as elected as you are. So therefore, greater coordination is needed. What is the latest, what are the latest, latest examples of that lack of coordination? coordination, coordination? You are aware of the blame game which is going on between the Maharashtra government on the one hand and the Railway Minister on the other. Yes. And then the civil aviation sector where we opened it yesterday for flights without adequately taking the uh, state governments into account. Now in today's India, you cannot impose your will unilaterally on the state governments, even on your own state government. And I'll tell you, when I was working on the value added tax, when I was finance minister, I faced the greatest opposition to that concept, to that idea, from a state which are ruled by BJP governments. So therefore, whether they are ruled by BJP, today the BJP chief ministers might be scared, might be afraid of the central government. In those days they were not, so they could speak their mind. But we need to take the chief ministers only on board with us, just as the chief ministers need in turn to take wholly on board the uh, district panchayati raj institutions along with the collector. Great. Uh, yes. 
Yeah. So the next question is from Sumit Takakar. He is a first year student of BBA. He is asking, uh, will the GDP rate affect prices of products post COVID? Affect okay, what? His question is, will the GDP rate affect the prices of products post COVID? Um, not the GDP rate, because prices, as you know, is a function of demand and supply. And therefore, if there is a product which, for which there is a huge demand and not enough supply, then prices will go up or there is a service, similar thing will happen. But, and that's why, you know, one talks about uh, balance between the supply side and the demand side. So it all depends on how the economy is managed in order to ensure that uh, prices don't rise. Right, sir. Sir, uh, I had one more question to ask. This is uh, from the perspective of students, uh, today's youth. Uh, when you see the current scenario of uh, our Indian politics in today's time and the way it has transformed post-2014, how would you recommend our younger generation you know, about the politics and what do you see the way ahead for uh, politics from the perspective of younger generation? Well, the younger generation has most at stake going forward. Uh, you and I may not be around. There is a huge demographic dividend that India enjoys. It may not last forever. In fact, I was reading somewhere that we have a window of only 10 years now. Uh, now we must ensure that demographic dividend does not become a disaster. Uh, all these is going. All this is going to reflect on the future of the younger generation. So the younger generation has a lot of lot at stake, and I think the younger generation must play its important part in determining the political course of India going forward, so that we have regimes in both states as well as at the center, which is sympathetic to their needs, their requirements, their demands, and their aspirations. If that is not so, then the younger generation will suffer. And, uh, you know, why only younger generation? Everyone will suffer in the process. And we are aware that that will lead to social tension, that will lead to law and order problems. Things might become unmanageable. So there's a lot of stake of the younger generation, and that stake can be uh, properly handled only if the younger generation starts playing a very constructive role as far as the political process of this country is concerned. And I'm not merely hinting at young people joining politics. They should, by all means, if they want to. But also, in their political behavior, in their voting patterns, it's very important to play a crucial, critical role in fashioning the future of the country. Right, sir. So there was also one more question uh, which uh, one of our students wanted to ask who is not present here. Uh, he wanted to basically know what are the books if you would like to recommend to our students and students across India you know, to read uh, in today's time, which is relevant from politics and economics perspective. Any book that you would like to recommend? Well, you know, I would, uh, I would, I'm, I'm a personally a great uh, a reader of uh, biographies and autobiographies. Okay. Because in my own personal life, I derive a lot of inspiration from the struggles of uh, uh, very eminent people that they faced in their own life, the challenges that they faced. And in my personal life, I have uh, learned from that and prepared myself to face those challenges. Um, but apart from that, you know, there are books on economics, there are uh, books on history. Uh, anyone who wants to be a complete citizen of India must have an idea of uh, India's own history, must have an idea of uh, the history of important countries of this world, must have an idea of the geography of India. It should not be insular. 
you know, if I'm studying political science and I'm only concerned about political science, and I'm studying engineering and I'm only concerned about engineering, it must be a whole education. And that whole education will come out only from reading all kinds of books, textbooks, related books, other books. But I have no recommendation with regard to specific books for today. Right, sir. Right. Uh, Shubham, any uh, sir, last question that we'd like sir, to take? Uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just unmute Alka ma'am before I proceed. Yes, yes. Sir, our uh, director for Amity Institute of Liberal Arts, she's here. Alka Parikh, Dr. Alka Parikh is here. She wanted to. Yes. Yes, Alka ma'am is muted. Unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Sinha, I wanted to say one thing. I'm a professor of economics and uh, when I heard your speech, I realized that it was very strongly rooted into economic principles. And uh, I was thinking that if you could just uh, record some of your lectures like this, then I guess professors all over India can actually use this as a, a part of their teaching because uh, this was talking about demand, this was talking about supply, this was talking about recession, this was talking about extraordinary uh, situations and how RBI can come into picture. I mean, it covered so many topics which were of great importance when we teach economics to our students. And that's why I thought that this was something which was uh, uh, maybe nobody has told you till now, but uh, I think that... Uh, this knowledge of economics and the knowledge of applying economics to the real situations in India is something which uh, not many people have the advantage of. And uh, you can actually help us out by recording some lectures for this, because this was a very insightful talk as far as all the principles of economics were concerned. So thank you very much. And I think this was extremely beneficial for our students. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to you for coming and talking to us and taking so much time out to answer all these questions also so patiently and in such an articulate manner. Thank you, sir. Alkaji, thank you very much. Um, just before we end, I must uh, thank you from uh, the bottom of, of my heart for this very good session that we had. I'd also like to remind you that I never studied economics in my youth. And uh, all that uh, uh, I have spoken has been to personal experience of uh, first uh, functioning in economic ministries in various positions as a civil servant, and then uh, being uh, a practitioner of economics over the last 30 years uh, in ministerial capacities and otherwise. So, Therefore, I, I, I say what I want to say about economics in very simple terms, uh, because that's how I understand the economics. So I do not find any jargon in my uh, talk on economics. But thank you very much, and uh, you're most welcome. If you want to record anything, we are today available on, uh, on for video conferencing, and we can, I will certainly be delighted to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Amity Institute of Liberal Arts, I thank Mr. Yashwan Sena for giving us time and sharing such insightful information as well as detailed deliberation into condition of Indian economy. We hope to host him someday in our university as well, where he can interact and uh, discuss few other perspectives and uh, in issues in much more and much greater detail with our students and where it will be much more enlightening as well. With this, I'd like to call an end to the session and I really thank all of you for joining today. Thank you. Thank you.